welcome to this joyous event. I'm Margot Finn, and I'm here on behalf of both the Dean of our faculty and our head of department, Eleanor Robson, who sadly is not able to be here in person, but will be watching the live stream. Um, I'm Sophie's colleague, and proud to be Sophie's colleague, and really delighted to be welcoming you here to this first uh, festive, scholarly, intellectual feast in person. Um, inaugural lectures uh, haven't happened in our faculty and our department for over two years, and it's so wonderful to join you this evening um, in person as well as online. Um, my uh, role is going to be very brief. Uh, this is the first of four inaugural lectures in our department. Uh, the next one will be Friday of next week, and at the end of um, Sophie's presentation, we'll give you a slide with all of those dates and titles. And I hope that we'll be seeing many more of you um, here for those other events as well. Um, the format for these events is that um, I will be handing over to Professor Charles Burnett of the Warburg, who will be introducing Sophie um, properly to you. She will then deliver her inaugural lecture, which we're all here to hear. Um, and then there will be an appreciation of uh, Sophie's lecture and Sophie uh, by Professor Peter Jones. Um, after that, um, instead of questions and answers, we will retire to the South Cloisters below, follow the crowd, and we can toast her, um, toast uh, Professor uh, Sophie there um, uh, after that event. So please do join us there. Um, the crowd will go down to the South Cloisters, so it will be easy to find. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to unclip myself and we're going to uh, clip the introducer. Thank you very much. Um, I feel very privileged in introducing Sophie. I think it's because of my seniority. She claims that I've, lived, I've known her for 30 years. I don't think it's quite that long, actually. <laughs> but it's getting on for 30 years. Um, and it's uh, been great knowing her for that period. Um, she has been, of those 30 years, she's been um, a lecturer, then probably senior lecturer, and now professor at University College London in the History Department since 2002. Before that, she had briefly um, a postdoc position in Cambridge at um, Fitzwilliam College. Um, I say briefly because, in fact, it was... Uh, well, um, it's quite unusual. It was uh, certainly nowadays, and even 20 years ago, for one to break off one's postdoc in order to get a proper job, um, which she did. Um, and before that postdoc, she was my PhD student at the Warburg Institute, um, and we felt very happy to have her as one of our members. And I think I can say um, that, in a way, she still belongs to the Warburg Institute. <laughs> so, um, anyway, we still see her a lot. Um, and we cooperate in the work that we do. Um, perhaps my first acquaintance with her um, was when she was looking for a topic for her PhD. Um, she'd already done some work on astrology. She'd worked, in fact, as an undergraduate. She wrote um, a very fine uh, dissertation on this English astrologer of the 14th century called Richard Trevidian. Um, and that, in fact, I think was her first publication with uh, the journal, in the journal of the Warburg Institute, Warburg and Institute in 2001. Um, so she already had an interest in astrology. And she came to me and said, I want to do a PhD on astrology in England sometime in the 12th century. Um, fortunately, she was able to expand to a larger area, and that is to, one well, might say, to magic. Um, or the various branches of the occult sciences um, by discovering that, in fact, there was a, quite a large number of manuscripts on this subject um, in the um, Benedictine Abbey of St. Augustine in Canterbury. Um, and so we start off with the conundrum, maybe. Why were there so many manuscripts on magic um, in a monastery? Um, a very orthodox monastery and a, a very fine monastery in which the kings, several Anglo-Saxon kings, had been buried, um, one of the largest monasteries in England at the time. And um, 
So she decided to uh, write her PhD on magic in St. Augustine's Canterbury um, and tackle this problem about you know, how is it compatible for um, uh, Christian monks um, uh, of a very fine intellectual caliber um, to appreciate, to read, to collect works on magic. Um, she looked at the practical aspects of magic too. Unfortunately, she only, di she only discovered one aspect, one, uh, one, um, one um, instance of magic actually being put into practice in the abbey. And that was, I think, um, something was lost by the monks and they get, just couldn't find this precious object anywhere. Um, so one of them must have decided, well, let's look at one of these magic texts and see whether we can use um, a technique um, in order to find this object. And they did find the object. Um, but maybe there were many more instances in which they were putting these books into practice, which we don't know about because they were not recorded. Anyway, um, while she, well, as I say, I mean, she, she was also doing astrology. I tend to um, see astrology and magic as being two separate um, roots, uh, endeavors, as it were. Um, and I think one could say that from these beginnings of uh, looking at magic, especially in respect to religion, to um, thought, to, especially to intellectual thought, um, and looking at astrology, especially in respect to its practice with Richard Trevelyan, for example, that these two strands um, continued, uh, she continued to pursue them throughout her intellectual life and to enrich and develop um, various streams within these two large areas. In fact, as I believe, her interest in these fields dates back to somewhat before her university career. I've been told that at the age of 14, she was busily engaged in writing a book on the model of Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. I don't know whether this book was ever finished, Perhaps it's still being written. But fascination with friendly dwarfs and elves and hobbits, half humans, daimones, animal souls, and the different ways one can pursue happiness has been, have been a leitmotif of her interests. She has drawn inspiration, just like J.R.R. Tolkien from images and texts of the Western Middle Ages. Earthly marvels populate her mind and her writings. And this interest involves, above all, magic. One can say that magic, um, uh, in short, describes the range of these interests. It is famously, famously described in the Guide to Hakim or Picatrix, um, written in the 11th or well, even 10th century, but translated into Castilian and Latin in the 13th century, and itself borrowing from the letters of the Brethren of Purity. These are great works of magic, um, or magical philosophy. The magic is famously described as the bringing together of spiritual and bodily ingredients to produce a wonderful thing that is contrary to the usual course of nature. This magic is not the state of hand of the stage magician, um, but a noble action arising from sympathy with the occult forces in nature. Spiritual beings, the daimones, the ruchaniyat, or the spiritus, to take respectively the Greek, the Arabic, and Latin terms, can be experienced, summoned, or felt as familiar spirits to aid one in effecting changes in this world. It was very appropriate that Philip Pullman, also inspired by medieval precedents, to create animal companions called daimones for his characters, should open the exhibition that Sophie curated at the Ashmolean Museum 
under the title Spellbound Magic, Ritual, and Witchcraft. The boundaries between magic and religion are as thin as a satin veil. In one of her many lectures on magic and religion, she mentioned a zodiac man with lines or arrows connecting each part of the body with the signs of the zodiac um, associated with that part, which was actually hung, displayed over a church altar. And she hypothesized that there was a deliberate or any anyway, subconscious imitation of Christ, the man of sorrows, just one of many connections between magical ritual, magical imagery, so imagery here, and Christian imagery. Aside from the Latin text that she has edited or analyzed, such as the Liber Essentia, the Essentia Spirituum, the book of the essences of the spirits, always the diamonds or spirits, and the Liber Razielis, which is dependent on Hebrew origins, Sophie has provided a most convincing classification of images related to magic, which I think all scholars should be following. And she has provided a very useful collection um, of astrological and magical images from the British Library, as well as many other useful tools uh, or interesting reading matter for scholars and indeed a larger public as well. Text and image are equally important for her. And I think I probably can add here, for her, magic is a noble subject um, which does good in the world. And this, you can tell from the titles of some of her articles. Uplifting souls, love in a time of demons, speaking with spirits, conversations with spirits, magic and the pursuit of wisdom, all very positive. This is a high quality of magic, um, which engaged um, some of the most um, um, deep thinking minds of the time. Her ideas and her knowledge of medieval sources have populated her writings and have drawn to her research students studying animals, magical recipes, and human affections. I think uh, if they're here, these research students will recognize themselves. These ideas are no doubt brought together in the topic of this lecture, Entangled Magic in the Medieval Latin West. I'm sure it will inspire us all. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much, um, Charles, for that very kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see so many friends, family, colleagues, and students here. Um, I'm going to start by briefly talking about how I came to be interested in medieval history and magic in particular, um, perhaps touching upon some things Charles has already mentioned. Um, as a third year undergraduate, I started investigating a 15th century London astrologer called Richard Trewithian. His more serious interests included interpreting the stars to understand politics, pregnancies, and the weather but he also had a very endearing habit of drawing self-portraits in his notebook on his birthday. And you have two of them here. Um, after studying this manuscript, I was hooked, not on astrology, though I did study with an astrologer in order to understand Trewithian's mindset and methods, but on working with medieval manuscripts. And I was lucky enough to be supervised by Peter Jones, who's here, and thank you for coming, Peter. Um, at UCL, the world of manuscripts opened up even further under the inspirational teaching of David Davre. Thank you for coming, David, um, on the Mars MA. And I continued on to a PhD on medieval magic, as Charles has already mentioned. Um, magic was appealing largely because it allowed me to think with questions about both religion and, and science. And this is what the monks I studied were also doing. 
Also in this slide are the picturesque ruins of St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury, um, which, as Charles mentioned, once included a library containing one of the most impressive collections of occult texts in Europe. Charles Burnett was a wonderful supervisor, and many of my fellow students at the Warburg Institute also supported and challenged my thinking. Some of my happiest times as an academic have been with collaborations with colleagues and artists. Some of them are shown here. Some of you are present here, for which I'm also very grateful. Um, and the wonderful film that was shown at the beginning while people were coming in by Annie Cottrell was also a collaboration that I very much enjoyed. Um, so as Charles has mentioned, one of these collaborations was the exhibition Spellbound, Magic, Ritual and Witchcraft at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. At the opening to the exhibition, we tried to persuade visitors of the contemporary relevance of magic and their own magical thinking by making them choose how to enter the exhibition through quite a narrow entrance. Um, under or around the ladder, and the results of what people did were very interesting. Um, we don't have a ladder here today, but I hope you'll find something of interest in my talk on the history of magic, whether or not you personally engage in magical thinking. So what I'm going to do in my talk on the history of magic is divide a period of about 500 years into six chronological stages to explore how supporters and critics of magic represented the art and how they responded to each other's arguments before reframing their own views in a continuous dynamic entanglement. Like other medieval rituals, those of learned magic consist of ordered, repeatable actions that reflect beliefs about the nature of the cosmos and express a desire to order people's relations with the sacred most importantly in medieval Europe with God, angels, and demons. Unlike institutional rituals, however, magic rituals were not underpinned by any requirements to communicate correct doctrine. This meant that their cosmological frameworks could be syncretic, elusive, and pragmatic rather than didactic. They could even, as in this image from a Spanish magic manual, include flying elephants. Moreover, in the fluid, creative, and unstable context of manuscript culture, occult texts acquired the qualities of playfulness and a continuously reworked craftsmanship. Every time a scribe copies a recipe, experiment, or complex ritual into a manuscript, they had the opportunity to alter, adapt, or add to it according to their personal interests, their cosmological certainties, their access to materials, or their anxieties about orthodoxy. And you have two examples here. On the right is a mainstream cosmological diagram with the Earth in the center surrounded by the spheres of the planets. But a scribe has added magical figures to the diagram, thus churning it into potentially a magical instrument and certainly something that no longer looks like something scientific. Um, in the diagram on the left, which is part of a ritual um, for acquiring knowledge from angels, a later scribe has rubbed out some of the magical words and drawn crosses all over it. So this is clearly someone who wanted to um, still preserve the instructions to gain knowledge from angels, but was worried about its orthodoxy. This means, as we shall see, that scribes, as well as authors and practitioners, were engaged in the dynamic entanglement of pro and anti-magic conversations. So my first stage is the reception of learned magic in the age of translation. I start with the period, great period of translations lasting roughly from the late 11th to the mid 13th century, when scholars from across Europe traveled to Spain, Sicily and the Middle East to translate works of science, philosophy, and the occult arts from Arabic, Greek, and Hebrew into Latin. The extraordinary flow of magic texts from diverse religious and often more sophisticated scientific traditions transformed the status of magic, as enthusiastic translators tried to place it as a branch of knowledge within mainstream philosophy and science, 
and some even argued that magic was the culmination of human knowledge. How easily were Arabic, Greek, and Jewish magic texts assimilated in practice? Some of their cosmological ideas and ritual actions aligned well with Christian science and theology, such as the idea that planets influenced the earth, that plants, herbs, and animals had hidden occult properties, or that sacred words like God's name were very powerful. Others, such as prayers to the planets, animal sacrifices, experiments to create new living beings, and rituals to trap spirits in talismans, were more discordant with Christian sensibilities. Although in this period, there was generally still a very positive reception of magic texts. The processes of adaption, adaptation to a Christian audience involved omissions and adaptation, personal predilections and habits. Translators tended to focus on magic texts with few religious ritual references and in some cases omitted details of myth and cosmology. Arabic jinns and Jewish angels often became more and more like Christian angels and demons in, success in, in successive copies of a text, as scribes reframed rituals in terms of their own belief. But sometimes strange and wondrous images were retained. After all, angels and demons had no bodies of their own and so could, on, could take on any form they liked. As magic texts disseminated outwards from the enthusiastic communities of translators, resistance to the idea of magic was as a, branch of, as a true branch of science was expressed by writers from religious orders who were used to thinking of knowledge as having a spiritual source as well as being found in books. The 12th century abbess, Herad of Landsberg, included magic in a diagram of philosophy in the seven liberal arts. But magicians and poets, you can, in fact, I don't know if you can see them with this desk, but they're here at the bottom of the image, um, are depicted receiving guidance from evil spirits who perch behind their heads. So this is not um, positive knowledge from God. This 12th century critique of magic prefigures the later idea of demonic teachers of witches. The final strand of the 12th century reception of magic is the influence of classical literature. This was important because it introduced the idea of extraordinary natural skill in performing magic that also influenced the mythologies of witchcraft. Medea, for example, was thought to be able to perform weather magic, to transform into a bird and to change the flow of water, among other skills. And here we have Circe, who is transforming men into pigs with her magic arts. So the second, the next stage um, in our chronology is how critics respond to this flow of magic texts into Europe and their circulation. And we're moving here from the late 11th to the mid 13th century um, in the first section. In the second half of the 13th century, learned magic, that is complex ritual texts circulating in manuscripts, came under new scrutiny, with critics focusing on three approaches. The first was to interpret the names of spirits and graphic motifs that in Arabic magic usually represented the constellations as a language of communication between humans and demons. Second, the talismans, talismans figurines, and other material culture of learned magic were condemned as objects of idolatrous worship. This accusation was a recognition of the rich visual nature of, le of learned magic, an expression of unease with the claims of some texts to teach how to make images come alive, and a defensive response in a culture that generally lacked the language or will to censor images. Late medieval Europe sits between two periods of iconoclasm and was generally quite um, flexible with regard to images. 
Finally, some critics were sensitive to the similarity between the powers that Orthodox Christian texts claimed for God, Christ, and the saints, and the powers that magic texts described, for example, the ability to walk on water, create new life, or speak to spirits. Critics of magic rejected the idea that anyone could achieve these astonishing outcomes simply by performing a ritual correctly. Practitioners of magic were therefore either delusional about the efficacy of it, or cynically using theatrical misdirection and knowledge of psychoactive substances to create the illusion of a supernatural experience. And certainly many magic texts do describe how to um, use parts of um, plants that we know to have psychoactive properties in their rituals. So what was the response of the authors of magic texts to these critiques? Generally, the, um, what happened next was a further adaptation of magic to the Christian worldview, although not always in an orthodox direction. Christian authors were inspired by the circulation of Arabic, Jewish, and Greek magic to write their own texts as early as the 12th century, but their number and variety evolved considerably between the 13th and 15th centuries. These new magic texts reacted to criticism of Arabic astral magic by outlining ritual sequences that had plausible efficacy within the medieval worldview and enough markers of orthodoxy to persuade readers that a good Christian could perform them. Rituals used the language of praise and devotion for God and incorporated fasting, meditation, and prayer. This magic was attractive to some readers curious for spiritual experiences and others interested in transgressive risk-taking. It focused above all on what Julien Veronese has called the Christian domestication of spirits, turning Arabic jinn, Jewish angels, and Greek daimones into demons that could be compelled to obey with Christian rituals of exorcism, or angels that, be could, persuade, that could be persuaded to be the companions of magicians as well as saints. Genres of text that modern scholars now categorize as angel magic and necromancy took different routes to these goals. Angel magic, which is illustrated here with images from different um, manuscripts, involved practitioners performing rituals to persuade angels to help them achieve various pious goals, notably the acquisition of knowledge, salvation, or a vision of God. Surviving manuscripts reveal that university students, physicians, and monks were particularly attracted to angel magic. But salvation, or the eternal bliss of the immortal soul, was an aspiration shared by all Christians. The routes to salvation in learned magic had various levels of difficulty. The full set of purification rituals required the practitioner of the Ars Notoria at least three years to perform. But on a more modest scale, the Almondale claimed that its angels will render someone perfect after he or she has spoken with them only once. Finally, and most efficiently, the Book of the Cow, a 9th century Arabic magic text translated into Latin in the 12th century, includes a recipe for making incense that has the power to make a soul good immediately. Not all medieval scribes were comfortable with these shortcuts to salvation, however, and sometimes left them out of their copies of the texts. A more transgressive version of Christian magic, necromancy, was the practice of conjuring and gaining control over demons so as to compel them to perform tasks, such as revealing buried treasure or gaining the favor of a priest. An experiment to catch a thief, that's this one on the left, in a 15th century demon conjuring manual, explains how to draw a magical figure with the name Satan in the center, which is particularly transgressive because in angel magic, either God and sometimes the practitioner, practitioner's name would be in the center. This text notes that the best time to summon demons is after the magical practitioner has been to church and heard mass. 
but that he must act quickly because the ritual will fail if the thief confesses his crime or gives the proceeds of his crime to the poor. In other words, the performative piety of hearing mass increases the success of a ritual, but the sincere piety of the target of the experiment can sabotage it. An even more provocative experiment commands the devil to infuse a mirror with his power so that a woman who looks into it will burn for love with love for the practitioner like the Blessed Virgin burns with love for God. The 13th century critique of learned magic, that under the guise of invocations to angels lay a true language of communication with demons, was used against magic throughout the Middle Ages. But it wasn't a particularly persuasive attack against practitioners who followed their own judgment as to what was acceptable for a good Christian to do, or those who believed they were following God's orders by commanding demons. The magician in this 15th century image wears an ostentatious cross on his clothing and claims to be acting as an agent of God when he subjects evil forces to his will. But his attitude is mocked in the accompanying text by the author, the English poet, John Lydgate, as a delusion, a delusion that is full of falsehood and fantasy, and in a wonderful term, Lydgate coins, of cursed imagination. So critical responses to necromancy and angel magic um, were very hostile and strong in the 14th century. At the beginning of the century, the Pope John XXII and a group of religious scholars developed the idea of the Satanic Pact. That is a formal written contract that involved the complete and explicit submission of the magical practitioner to demons. The pact was a logical endpoint to the idea that magical rituals involved willing practitioners and implicit demonic worship. And it opened the way for more serious penalties for real or assumed demonic entanglements. Meanwhile, in, in 1398, members of the, of the theology faculty at the University of Paris were so incensed by the popularity of angel magic among teachers and students that they issued a set of proclamations against the idea that magic could be used for good purposes or for the honor of God. From this point onwards, the circulation of angel magic texts moved under the radar, and their authors no longer openly claimed to have been divinely inspired to write magic texts. So my fifth chronological stage is demons, astrology, and the rise of theoretical treatises. Although openly practicing magic was dangerous in the 14th century, sympathetic theorists of magic emerge in this period, writing under their own names rather than the usual mythical pseudonyms. Often working as court physicians and astrologers, these author magicians were keenly aware of the critiques of angel magic and necromancy and turned away from Christian ritual forms to scientific and cosmological knowledge. They viewed demons as an imminent and powerful threat, but thought that their powers could be harnessed by magical practitioners drawing on the methods of astrology, in particular knowledge of the positions and movements of the planets and ideas about their nature and influences. They recommended using these techniques to calculate the locations and times in which demons would appear, understand the tasks that they were assigned, and to invoke spirits that were higher up in the hierarchy to gain control over them. The new prominence of astrology also provoked a rethinking of the perfect magus along astrological and physiological lines. In earlier magic texts, the ideal practitioner was presented as a virtuous Christian and exorcist acting in the name of God. But now author magicians like the Italian university lecturer Antonio de Montolmo thought that there were men and women whose strong wills, particular physical constitutions, that is in medieval terms, their humoral balance, and their powerful birth horoscopes, 
the particular combination of planets um, that were in the heavens at the time of their birth resulted in magical powers that included the abilities to heal or harm with their gaze, voice, or touch alone. The ideas of this group of authors encompassed the prestigious art of astrology, demonology, medicine, and folk beliefs like the power of the evil eye, usually particularly attributed to old women. In the 15th century, this entanglement of medicine, magic, and folklore became one of the characteristics of witchcraft literature. Um, so my sixth and final chronological stage um, is focused particularly on witchcraft and Renaissance humanism. The 15th century authors of witchcraft and humanist texts explored the powers and limits of the natural human capacity to do magic in ways that often downplayed the significance of ritual but elaborated on magic's cosmological framework. Authors of witchcraft treatises had to balance skepticism about the capacity of humans to perform magical feats with their desire to nurture belief in the reality of witchcraft. Witches were not usually thought to be able to follow the instructions of complex magic texts or to conjure spirits to do their bidding. Their harmful magic worked either because demons were the true agent behind it or because demons had taught witches how to do magic or pretended to do so in order to give witches an illusory sense of their own agency. Nevertheless, persecutions of witches were influenced by local beliefs in the extraordinary and malign powers of some humans, such as the stereotype of women who possessed the evil eye. One influential belief was the power to turn into animals, from birds and flies to cats, foxes and wolves. In accounts of 15th century witchcraft trials in the Alpine region, for example, witches are often said to transform into wolves a motif that probably originated in local folklore. Hans Frund, a scribe from Lucerne, wrote that local witches had confessed that they ran after sheep, lambs, and goats in their wolf forms and ate them raw before turning back into men and women when they wanted to. A few decades after Frund's chronicle, the Dominican inquisitor Heinrich Kramer told a story in which demons took on the appearance of cats with the help of witches to attack a laborer in the Diocese of Strasbourg. In these cases, the blurring of the boundaries of human, animal, and demon by 15th century witchcraft theorists endowed the magical practitioner with new powers. In 15th century Italy, a new intellectual climate allowed the positive attitudes towards magic discussed in the previous section to be underpinned by humanist currents of thought. Medieval and Renaissance theorists both saw a continuity between the classical past and contemporary magic, but medieval interpretations focused on the deceit of demons, arguing that demons cunningly adapted their strategies of war on mankind to suit different religious and cultural contexts. In the ancient world, they had taken the names of the planets in order to be thought to be celestial gods and trick men into worship, worshipping them. In the present, demons tried to deceive magical practitioners into believing that they had descended from heaven and were angels. In their speculations about the relationship that learned magic had with its past and future, Renaissance theorists offered two striking innovations. They were more interested than their medieval predecessors in reconstructing the real cultural world of the classical magi. And they placed more emphasis on the positive role that magic might play in shaping humanity's future. This marked a shift away from the primary emphasis in medieval learned magic on the problems and pleasures of earthly life and the fate of souls in the afterlife. Um, and to illustrate humanist approaches to magic and um, their relationship to medieval texts and rituals, um, I turn now to two images of magicians 
from the manuscripts of the Encyclopedic Natural History of the ancient Roman author Pliny, whose work was popular in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Pliny's um, devoted an entire book, um, book 30, to magic. And the, what we have is quite an interesting set of um, images. This is M, all the M's that you've seen in previous slides is M for magic. Um, illustrators usually, in spite of the ancient context, chose to depict contemporary magicians. Um, but some depict magicians, some witches. And we have um, interesting views of changes over time in what um, the artists thought that a magical practitioner was doing and looked like. So in his work, The Natural History, Pliny's intention had been to show that the bounty of the natural world was what made man's achievement possible, whether in agriculture, healing, or art. His descriptions of the appearance and properties of natural materials and his celebration of the high level of civilization that Rome derived from these appealed to medieval encyclopedists for whom God had played, placed uses in all parts of his creation and to Renaissance thinkers who were engaged in an idealizing reconstruction of antiquity. But magic was, of course, a much more challenging craft to recover or revive than classical medicine or art, not least because Pliny, Pliny viewed it as fraudulent, corrupt, and dangerously seductive, an analysis many of 15th century readers of his text would have agreed with. Pliny's account of the origins and history of magic is the story of a contagious superstition spread across the ancient world and even into what he calls the void of nature by credulous and greedy travelers, armies, and exiles. This first image from a Pliny manuscript um, is from a book that belonged to a secretary and cousin of the Pope, Gregorio Lolli Piccolomini. Here, instead of the necromancer commanding demons, he is snatched away by them, his feet still attached to the magic circle in which he had presumably performed his conjurations. And we would expect this kind of negative um, image, perhaps in a manuscript owned by a papal secretary. Unlike the previous, the, the images that I showed you in previous slides, we don't have a magician summoning the demons at the point where he still has power over, him, over them. But what is illustrated is the point where the demons take away his soul. This image not only proposes that magic cannot protect the body or soul of the practitioner, but it also evokes one of the earliest failed magicians, Simon Magus. In the foreground, um, and this for me is a particularly interesting part of the image, um, an enchanter is depicted trying to, to charm a serpent called an asp that is resisting by blocking its ear with the tip of his tail. This is actually quite a common image in um, medieval iconography, but it's usually found in a moralizing context where the asp represents sinners who block their ears to virtue. Um, and in this case, I think it's an early and quite interesting idea about nature resisting the magician. Um, for medieval thinkers, this idea works because animals were part of goods, God's good creation, and therefore they should be able to resist the powers of demonic magic. My second image is from a manuscript belonging to the humanist Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who had a much more positive view of magic, um, although he also was inclined to define and condemn particular kinds of magic um, as being linked to evil spirits. The artist of this manuscript faced the challenge of representing magic in a negative light, in a way that was true to Pliny and Pliny's ideas, while also alluding to the positive potential in magic, 
that we see in Pico's works, and we have evidence that um, Pico de la Mirandola was heavily involved in the construction and thinking of the illustration programs in this manuscript. Um, and this is a new direction um, in Renaissance theorists of magic. The solution of the artist was to incorporate depictions of three different kinds of magic within the image, Roman agricultural magic, contemporary ritual magic, and an idealized Magus in the classical tradition. So at the top of the image, we have an equine skull and a string of pomegranates, um, both of which have uses according to Pliny. One, to rid a garden of caterpillars, and the second to rid um, a field of snakes. In the center is a bent over and anxious looking necromancer sacrificing a bat in a magic circle. This image of magic evokes Pico de la, de la Mirandola's category of goetia, goetia, that is magic performed with the aid of evil spirits and contrasts with the portrayal of an idealized classical magus to the left of the illumination, that's here, dressed in special clothing and looking at the head of a black ram on what is probably a pagan altar. This magician, whose appearance and ritual blends elements of classical past and Renaissance present, engages in animal sacrifice as a minister of nature, a practitioner of natural magic, according to the now to the new positive assessment of magic represented by Pico de la Mirandola and other humanist writers. In fact, the, um, the head of the black ram is mentioned by Pliny, but in the context of the practice of um, magic engaged in by the emperor Nero, Pliny suggests that the reason magic doesn't work is that um, rituals include ingredients that are almost impossible to find, like the head of a perfectly black ram. And the proof that magic was fraudulent was that Nero, who had an inclination to practice magic and all the um, resources of an empire at his disposal, was able to find all the impossible ingredients, but still unable to make um, magic work. In this talk, I've tried to show how medieval sympathizers and critics of magic were responsive to each other's perspectives. And I conclude with a few comments on the relationship between literary tradition, practice, and cult. Medieval critics generally understood practitioners of magic to be working by and for themselves, as distinct from heretics and witches who belonged to sects, that is, large organized groups with initiation rites, communal practices, and long-term goals that included the overthrow of the secular and religious institutions of Christendom. Our sources suggest that some communities of readers and copyists did develop around a book or books of magic. In Arabic astral magic, the addition of companions added solemnity to the ceremony, increased the depth of reverence addressed to spirits, and created a community invested in the ritual success that was sometimes cemented with a communal meal. In necromantic rituals, the presence of multiple companions seems mainly designed to guard against demonic force and malice. A text called the Clavicula Salomonis recommends between one and nine companions. And if you can't find anyone to help you, at the very least, the author says, bring a dog to intimidate the spirits. So I'm my final image is an image of some dogs. Um, both critics and sympathizers tend to use the language of schools and scholars or societies and companions when discussing magic rather than cult or sect. For critics, however, the practitioner's intimacy with demons was an object of opprobrium, even horror. The early Christian thinker Augustine, in a phrase repeated by several prominent theorists of magic, calls it a toxic fellowship of humans and demons. But more sympathetic medieval sources on magic reveal a vibrant culture of exchanges of texts 
between members of religious orders, physicians, laymen, clerics, and laywomen. A culture of discussion, borrowing, critique, and adaptation. Thank you. I, I, I was the supervisor of Sophie's wonderful um, undergraduate dissertation on the astrologer Richard Trewithian, and I have followed her career from afar quite often, uh, but with great admiration ever since. Um, she has been able to take um, that focus on one individual and their as it were, mental horizon as a money lender, medic, astrologer, all the different things that Richard Trewithian was, and expand this to take in the whole of medieval magic, but never abandoning the thought that there is a, a horizon within which a practitioner of magic, like an astrologer, must work and live. Well, what we've had today, of course, is something on a much grander scale, which is uh, a synoptic history of medieval magic in 40 minutes. I mean, I challenge anybody to try and do that. Um, but Sophie has done it here today. So we've seen every variety of medieval magic, and we've seen the ebb and flow of the conversations about magic both those who champion magic and those who oppose it. And this has been an extraordinary uh, compact story told here. We've also been treated to the most extraordinary lecture on images, just looking at these pictures and telling us what to make of them is another enterprise in itself. So we've been very fortunate in having Sophie's skill at interpreting images as well as her ability to marshal arguments about learned magic. Um, I don't want to say a lot more. I, I would like for a moment to ventriloquize because um, unfortunately, Professor Lee Olson, uh, who would have been here and would have said something about Sophie's lecture was unable to come. So for the moment, I'm going to behave as if I was Professor Lee Olson. Um, she is a, a specialist in charms um, from the late antique period through to the early modern. And she uh, would wish to say that the sense of entanglement that Sophie has talked about today has been illuminating uh, to her, um, and she finds it an extraordinarily uh, accurate way of thinking about the nature of a medieval charm, which may contain elements of a Christian ritual, literally spoken out aloud, it may contain sacred names, it may contain um, folkloric elements, it may contain strange um, behaviors, all of these, as it were, entangled together within one brief verbal charm. So in, in that way, um, the bigger story that, that Sophie has been telling can be also used to illustrate um, the workings of a single medieval charm. Um, I would finally like to say uh, a, something about two individuals. Having started with Richard Trewithian, my two individuals are the Franciscan Roger Bacon, who in the 1260s um, launched an extraordinary program of writings addressed to Pope Clement IV, which were an attempt to persuade that Pope that the occult arts, namely astrology, alchemy, and magic, could be deployed by the Pope and the Christian rulers of Europe to fight the three great challenges of the 1260s, um, the incursion of the Mongols, the fall of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and as Roger Bacon saw it, the internal corruption of the Christian church if only magic, alchemy, and astrology could be harnessed by the papacy and Western Europe, then, um, after all, the, the uh, apocalypse might be avoided. So this is an extraordinary perspective, um, and one which shows the ways in which magic, as it were, 
was not just an internal uh, thing for the individual to promote their own welfare, but could be thought of as central to the enterprise of defending Christian Europe. And, and lastly, I want to return to an individual, an English individual, at the end of the 15th century, John Argentine, later to become provost of King's College, my college, but primarily a doctor to Prince Arthur, the son of Henry VII, but also his chaplain. And in his own notebooks, John Argentine reflects on the uses of astrology, alchemy again, and magic in, in the service of medicine and of uh, promoting the education of the young Prince Arthur. So uh, here we can see an individual in his own notebook reflecting on the different arguments in favor of, um, in his case, the use of the Latin picatrix, um, his uh, casting of horoscopes, his uh, use of the quintessence in trying to uh, save Prince Arthur from his early death. So here is another individual um, in whom, as it were, the, the various themes of Sophie's lecture uh, of entanglement are, are made manifest in his own private notebooks. So I, I will leave it there, but just to say that we have been treated to the most extraordinary overview of medieval magic. So thank you, Sophie.